Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Consumer Devices Landscape webinar. During this webcast, we'll review and discuss the results concluded through a study of more than 1,000 consumers who own more than one device. This research effort focused on tasks they perform with those devices and how well those devices perform those tasks, allowing TBR to plot the likely future course of the consumer devices market. In the next 45 minutes, analyst Jack Narcotta and principal analyst Ezra Gothau will share what they learned, helping you understand what consumers do with their devices, how well they like them, and what kinds of devices they are likely to buy in the future. Before I pass this over to Ezra, I'd like to review some brief logistics. First, we're recording today's session and will be posting it on our YouTube site, TBRI Channel. We encourage you to visit our channel to watch this presentation or any of the others that we've posted. Second, we'd like to hear your opinions and thoughts on the materials we're presenting. Please send any questions or comments to the Q&A or chat function. Jack and Ezra will address them at the end of the presentation. Or if you'd like to set up a client inquiry for more detailed discussion, please reach out directly to Jack, Ezra, or myself at the end of the webinar to set up that conversation. Third, we'll send up the slides to everyone registered for today's webcast within 24 hours of the conclusion of the webinar. You can also find the slides as well as thought leadership pieces, webinar decks, and commentaries on SlideShare at www.slideshare.net backslash TBR underscore market underscore insight. And I'll share all these social media links with you again at the end of the presentation. Now let me introduce Jack Narcotta and Ezra Gothel. Jack has more than 15 years in the IT industry, which ranges from the early days of Ethernet and telecommunications to the current revolution in mobile technology. As an analyst in TBR's computing practice, Jack is primarily responsible for reporting on hardware vendors such as Motorola, Nokia, Samsung, and Sony, as well as focusing on trends and opportunities with the Chrome, Android, and iOS ecosystems. Ezra leads our devices practice, which includes coverage of smartphones, tablets, and PCs, as well as other related devices and device platforms. Along with uh, the devices coverage, Ezra also covers social media. He's been covering the computing industry for over 20 years, and his insight has proven invaluable to our hardware and platform clients. And with that, let me hand this over to Ezra. Thank you, Allison, and welcome, everybody. Um, we have kind of uh, hijacked this, this webinar. Uh, we, we, uh, we're going to discuss for the full body of the webinar the results of our most recent uh, consumer devices survey. Um, and, and we will be covering that um, in, in part of our webinar. But because of the uh, Lenovo acquisition, primarily of, of Motorola, but also of, of, uh, of IBM uh, x86 uh, servers, we thought this was a good time to begin a discussion about devices portfolios, uh, the vendors that are, are develop, developing them, the strengths and weaknesses, uh, challenges and opportunities involving uh, having a, a portfolio of, of diverse devices. So we will uh, devote the first part of the webinar to a review of the findings from the, from the uh, devices survey, which is very appropriate to a discussion of uh, devices portfolios. Individual users slash buyers have collections of devices, their portfolio. Vendors have their collection of offered devices, their portfolio, and, and uh, there are interesting effects ha across the buyers and the sellers of these devices. Uh, then we're going to go on and we'll, we'll talk about the Lenovo acquisition, acquisitions and their implications. Then we will talk a bit about some of the implications of, of having a portfolio, what it, what it means for a vendor to, to, to produce multiple devices of different form factors. And finally, we will, we will discuss some other uh, uh, potential acquisitions in the, in the portfolio, um, portfolio uh, generation process and some other devices that might, might be included in portfolios. So to, for the first part of the discussion, the discussion of the results of the, of the uh, North American uh, Devices Landscape Survey, I, I hand the, the, uh, the microphone over to Jack Narcotta, who is lead analyst on, the, on that study. Jack? Jack, I think you're still on mute. Oh, I apologize for that. 
<laughs> there you go. <laughs> yep, there we go. Here in uh, snowy New Hampshire. <laughs> A little slow in the draw this morning. Um, so regardless, what, what we have uh, today, and thanks very much, Ezra, um, but what, what we have today is um, a, a two-part discussion, as Ezra mentioned, that is very related, that, that are very related uh, to, to one another. And um, it's certainly not a surprise that the two discussions are so similar and that complement each other, but one of the things that we've seen was that our devices study um, the core themes that were established in that are really beginning to resonate in the industry, which is causing a lot of um, certainly not uh, not not chaos, if you will, but is is really affecting change and having a a ripple effect that continues to to propagate through through the marketplace. So as we move through the study, try and keep in mind some of the major points and how they're applying to some of the the broader company views and landscape views that we're going to be taking a looking at a little bit later on once we get away from the specific devices study and start moving into uh, some of the changes that Lenovo as well as its rivals in the marketplace are, are affecting in the marketplace today. So um, getting into the specifics of the study, um, a client contracted us to uh, take a look at the um, in, in journalism, I think they're called uh, the, the big questions or the headline questions. It's the, the who, the what, the where, the why, the when, and the how. And what we did was we took a, a, a very aggressive sample of consumers in the marketplace that owned at least one device. So ideally it was a consumer that owned a PC and then on top of that owned either a smartphone or a tablet or any combination of those three devices. And what we were looking for, really, was an understanding of what's driving consumers um, since the mobile devices market is uh, primarily geared for the uh, geared for consumer customers. What we tried to take a look at were, or tried to uncover through through the study were what were the drivers that were um, making people move or transition from one device to another so um, when we get into uh, some of the more specific questions of it, it was what types of devices are uh, consumers using for um, their uh, productivity-related tasks. That's certainly a broad term, but anything that would require um, input-intensive or uh, document editing or content creation, and then certainly how they're using their devices to communicate, and then how they're looking to um, interact with the entertainment world, be it through um, casual online gaming experience, such as on a mobile device, or any kind of uh, gaming or social media that might take place on a desktop. So um, we, we uh, sampled a, or collected a sample of as broad as, of a stroke as we could, as, as we could get within the time frame of the project. And the primary, uh, or the the primary point that bubbled up to the top was the marked um, importance of a keyboard. Um, and with the study being conducted toward the tail end of last year, this really resonates with some of the newer devices that we've seen, especially if you've watched any of the major sporting events recently. Uh, there's been a big focus by Intel to promote the capabilities of the two-in-one device um, although in that commercial context, I certainly wouldn't recommend trying to get a PC by pouring a cup of coffee on your keyboard. Um, but the multi-mode PCs that we're seeing from Dell, HP, Lenovo, these devices that can transform and that ultimately, based on the results of the study, accentuate the tasks that consumers look to use most, uh, look to use a PC for most often. So that's things like um, managing their calendar or shopping online or writing longer emails than um, than a mobile device might than it might be more comfortable on a mobile device. So it's tasks that they've traditionally assigned to a PC but have begun to want to use on their tablet. And what we've seen is that this new blended or hybrid form factor really is beginning to resonate with some of the activity drivers that our consumers showed us when they responded to our survey and in our online focus group. So <clears throat> one of the other things that we found was that 
smartphones are not only the luxury uh, or not 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 only a a necessity item, but they are uh, the premium device for any kind of communication, um, whether it's for um, what I call a quick hit type of communication, be it a one-way conversation, either through an email, um, responding to something on the go via um, any of the available email services, in, including text. Um, certainly, they are the, the de facto standard for communication. Um, one of the interesting things that we saw was that um, there were some users that are trying to use their, their devices for PC-related tasks um, typically for online shopping or for research, uh, for looking something up on the web. And one of the frustrations they had ties back a little into some of the strengths of the PCs and what Ezra likes to call the worky tasks is the tactile or the physical input of, of actually having a keyboard um, that is uh, significantly more, more precise and ultimately more comfortable to use uh, than the software-based keyboards, even though great strides are con continue to be made in the realm of predictive text and the usability of software keyboards. And then for tablets, and this is really critical to this particular part of our discussion in regards to the survey, so while most of our users in the study showed that they're using their tablets for entertainment purposes, the users of tablets that were gearing their studies or that were gearing their activities more towards their, their studies or their work environment or any kind of productivity-related task, those were the the uh, the customer base or the customer segment that was really trying to make a transition from a tablet to not necessarily a PC but a blend of the two products. And what we found was that in three distinct price bands, which have been primarily influenced certainly by the retail price of Apple's iPad, but in the five to six hundred dollar range, that consumers were very comfortable with that price and were looking for ways to augment or improve their tablet experience. So while enjoying the, the entertainment aspects, uh, the instant on, certainly the things that if you're a tablet user uh, really begin to resonate with you, amplifying that and augmenting that with some productivity related tools, um, peripherals tended to fall flat and consumers were looking for a device that could still keep the essential things that drew them to a tablet in the first place but ultimately could become a bridge product or a crossover product into or back into the world of the traditional notebook PC form factor. So when we plotted out all the different activities among the three different product groups, what we started to see were holes in where the form factors were um, were able to support different types of activities. And what this really highlights is the, the emergence and the very astute calculations that a lot of the PC manufacturers have found um, or have, have made over the last uh, couple quarters is building devices that are a blend of the two products. Really, the takeaway from here should be that the next wave of devices are not going to be um, iterative improvements to notebook PCs or to desktop PCs or to tablets, what we'll start to see based on, and especially based on the results in the consumer market, which drives a tremendous amount of volume of business um, in terms of revenue and unit shipments through through the marketplace, is a, a, a wave of blended form factors from a variety of different vendors uh, that address the, the crossover opportunities that exist between or that exist among rather all of these different product categories. Um, pricing for these particular devices is certainly wildly variable, um, but when we the study found that when we get a that when the pricing for the devices begins to creep up around the five or six hundred dollar range, that that's when a, a a consumer really views the device as a do-it-all device. They want their one device to replace the multiple devices in their household, but certainly they also want the low-cost tablet to be their entertainment um, center. It's something that sits on a coffee table or on a couch, um, on a nightstand, or they want their PC, especially their desktop PC, to be the storage hub of the household to which other devices can connect and then stream 
content or be able to access a different variety of services. So it it really uh, signals a a market that's currently in in flux and really um, one of the companies that uh, continues to capitalize on this n not only by being aware of the trends that are evident in the consumer marketplace but also beginning to make waves of its own is Lenovo and at this point I'll turn I'll turn it back to um, to Ezra to highlight some of the salient points about uh, the recent news regarding Lenovo. Thank you, Jack. Okay, so so Lenovo uh, announced two acquisitions over the course of the last two weeks, and uh, the the upshot of both of these uh, acquisitions is the Lenovo in 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 a market that is overall growing more slowly than it has been has found a way to grow. It's found a way to grow by by uh, by making a couple of of key acquisitions. In doing so, it, it solves one of, of Lenovo's chronic problems, a problem that it first solved with a similar solution back when it acquired the PC division from, from, uh, from IBM in, in 2004-2005, which is that Lenovo is the leading vendor uh, across a bunch of form factors in China. Um, it is not the leading vendor, but it has a very significant market share in servers, and it has a very significant market share in smartphones. It, it, it ran up against Samsung in, in, in smartphones and, and moved to within fractions of a percentage point in market share over the course of the year. And, and Lenovo's growth in smartphones and in tablets globally has been remarkable, uh, literally triple-digit growth. However, it comes off a small base, and Lenovo is still, and and the base that's based in China, although it is, it's definitely expanded its market outside China in both those categories. So what these acquisitions do for Lenovo is it immediately gives them a global presence in the, both those product categories. It, in, in particular, in smartphones, it gives them an entree into a market they regard as critical, which is the North American market. It's very difficult to penetrate market because the, the network providers, uh, the big four or the big two, uh, dominate the distribution of smartphones in the United States, and they have a number of, of brands that they are already holding. One of they're already promoting. One of which is Motorola. So, Lenovo bought a, a an opportunity to, uh, to to play immediately in the North American space. At the same time. The acquisitions play to a Lenovo strength and a, a relative weakness or at least a stylistic difference with the companies from which they acquired these businesses. Lenovo is wholeheartedly, enthusiastically in the business of producing low-margin har hardware and proliferating products to meet the, the, the changing demands of the market, market niches, the the, the uh, the fleeting interests of, of the, the consumer market. That's what Lenovo does. That's what Lenovo likes to do. That's not something that either IBM or Google likes to do. And interestingly, it's not something that, uh, that, that its two big PC competitors, HP and Dell, like to do in PC. Lenovo does that, likes to do it. And so these acquisitions um, play into Lenovo's strengths because these are things that these other companies, the companies from which Lenovo acquired these things, do not like to do. Lenovo got good prices for both of these acquisitions. Next slide, please. So what is, what, uh, why does Lenovo want to be in all these categories? Why does Lenovo want a broad global portfolio? The big one is, is brand. Lenovo is 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 aiming to, to to make its brand increase its brand awareness worldwide. And now Lenovo holds three brands that all of which have some real equity. The Lenovo brand itself, which Lenovo has succeeded in bringing from obscurity outside China to general awareness outside China. It's not a, a brand that leaps to mind in many markets at the top of the heap, but it's People are aware of its presence. The ThinkPad brand, 
which is, is very strong and Lenovo still uses, the Think and ThinkPad brand. And now it has the Motorola brand, a brand whose awareness probably outshines its, its market presence at the at, And by the way, the origin of the term Motorola is they were the first to make radios for, for automobiles. That was, that was how Motorola was. Was made. You, Lenovo has also generated what I think is a potentially extremely strong brand uh, within itself, which is yoga. It, it, it applied originally to a particular uh, convertible PC that's literally bent over backwards to, to, to assume a, a tablet-like configuration and, and two other configurations, but has now applied that, that same brand to a, a, an unusual form factor in a tablet. Um, I think it's a it's a great name. It, it 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 conveys literally, you know, obviously flexible strength. It 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 has got graphical appeal. It's generally a positive uh term. It's it's global, um and and, and it's short and, and it sounds good. It's it's a brand I think Lenovo is going to promote. So Lenovo has some, some brand uh management issues ahead of it. I don't think these are Super Bowl issues, but it, it needs to figure out how to keep, how to lever, fully leverage its, its subsidiary brand while increasing the awareness of its umbrella brand. Um, the other thing about Lenovo is it, is it has had a long-term relationship with IBM ever since the, the acquisition of the personal computer division. And IBM uh, continued to provide services for a lot of Lenovo's PCs. Um, in, in the in the announcement regarding the the uh, acquisition of the X86 server, server business, uh, the two companies talked about their ongoing relationship going forward, which will serve both companies in that uh, IBM will be able to provide services and more specialized hardware to customers of the Lenovo X86 products that it acquired from from IBM, and Lenovo will be able to continue to sell into existing IBM customers, which it does currently with the same product as, as, as well. So this has strengthened that alliance, and we believe that it has also strengthened its alliance with Google. Now, obviously, Lenovo has a long-term relationship with Google. Google is a provider of the operating system for many of its mobile devices, but we think this makes Lenovo, Lenovo closer to Google going forward. Google obviously solved the problem with its competing with its partners in making uh, uh, smartphones and tablets, at least of, um, on a, a major brand, not the Google brand. And, and that, that, that's one of the ways the alliance serves them. But I think that that's something um, that Lenovo has in its favor, is, is a, a, a tighter partnership with Google. Uh, finally, uh, Lenovo faces the big two in in broad-based device amongst broad-based device vendors. There's the obvious Apple and Samsung who have dominated the smartphone market, um, own the majority of the tablet market, certainly take uh, an enormous proportion of the profits to be made in, in both those markets. But we believe those co competitors have vulnerabilities. They're still strong companies, no doubt, but not ones that Lenovo cannot gain share on. We think Apple is uh, migrating into a comfortable niche for itself in the premium end of the devices market, a place that is always played. It will not allow itself to uh, let its market share drop as far as it did in PCs back in the, in the 90s, but it is quite comfortable with a minority share and a majority of the, of the profits. And, and while it wants to continue to grow and will continue to grow, it will not be concerned about losing share. Of course, it gained all this share when it has zero competition and effectively zero competition in the market. The, market. So the loss of shares is inevitable. Samsung which will continue, of course, to be a very strong competitor as well with a very strong global brand, a, a complete verticalization that takes both of the components. Uh, and, and a breadth of products that, that expand far beyond the devices market. However, Samsung uh, spends enormous amounts of money on its on its marketing, and the marketing loading on its devices is quite high, which uh, 
handicaps limit, uh, Samsung in the competition at the low end of its critical uh, smartphone and tablet markets. That's an area where Lenovo can play. Lenovo has grown in those devices markets largely on the basis of being one of the lower priced name brand vendors in those markets, and we believe it will continue to do so. Next slide, please. So why do companies uh, look at portfolios? What, what's important to them? What, what advantages do they, do they see in, in portfolios? And what challenges do portfolios having a, a breadth of product offering uh, pose to the, to the vendor company? Well, the Lenovo sees two major advantages in, in, in having a larger number of customers and a larger number of devices from which there are customers. The first is obviously the, 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 the clear benefits of scale, of ha being able to strike more favorable deals with components vendors, being able to uh, strike more favorable deals both with, with uh, ODMs and, and contract manufacturers, Lenovo also has a long-term commitment to a mixed supply chain. It manufactures and will continue to manufacture many of its own devices. It contracts for and will continue to contract for many of its own devices. Uh, and the more of these devices it sells, the lower its prices per device. The scale is an obvious one there. The other is brand. Lenovo wants to be a global company. Lenovo is a global company. It wants to be a larger global company. And the more devices it has there that have the Lenovo brand either up front and, and uh, on top or uh, as from Lenovo uh, in addition to an existing brand, the more brand awareness there is and the more cross-product uh, fertilization uh, there is. However, Lenovo is stretching across two major market types, market segments. Ones that are hard to bridge and have different marketing sales perception device requirements. That's obviously the commercial market and the consumer market. Uh, the way things have worked out, the, the smartphone is largely a consumer market sell. Uh, the tablet, <laughs> excuse me, tablet is, is mostly and, and, and frankly, if you treat Windows tablets as PCs, which we prefer to do, it's even more mostly a consumer sell. The PC is a mixed, a stretch, a bridge market, and that stretch has been a challenge to the major PC vendors. They typically make uh, considerably lower margins on their on their consumer devices than they do on their commercial devices. And then finally, obviously, the, the data center hardware that business Lenovo is committed to was already in, is now in with, with even greater commitment. Uh, that is a, almost entirely a it is entirely a commercial space, notwithstanding the few of us who buy service for our home. Uh, so that, that requires management across uh, two really different segments and a coordination or a choosing not to coordinate between these two segments. And because there's overlap, especially in the PC market, that's a challenge. How do you get the benefits of scale? How do you get the benefits of, of, of brand recognition? And it's, it's the same time, appropriately distinguish your brand as appropriate to those two different markets and not confuse the market in, in that, that space. Another thing that many multi-device vendors seek to gain is a, a benefit in cross-selling and, and, and increasing, the, you know, increasing loyalty from one device to another and increasing loyalty uh, sequentially as to refresh their devices. And the port, using a portfolio to do this has proven to be a challenge because everything that vendors do to make devices work better together implicitly makes them work less well with other devices from other vendors, which diminishes their, their perceived value in the market. A any device, even Apple devices, has to work well with other devices or Apple loses opportunities of get, making sales to people who own a collection of devices that are primarily non-Apple devices. That very facility, iTunes on Windows, for instance, that allows you to merge an Apple device into a non-Apple collection of devices 
is the facility that means that once you have an Apple collection of devices, you can choose to renew one of your devices with a non-Apple product. The door that you must leave open to bring in new customers inevitably it presents a door that, that is open to customers leaving your platform. The approaches to creating that kind of cross-platform selling and, 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 and that kind of loyalty lay, we believe, more in the realm of, of, of combined services and combined brand identity and, and, and identification with the vendor. Uh, next slide, please. So going forward, um, we believe that, that uh, in, the, in the attempt to, to form, uh, to put together portfolios, and because uh, in the individual markets for particular types of devices, there are now companies that are sort of ripe for acquisition, if they fall to the bottom of the heap in market share and so on, we will see some, some more acquisitions and, uh, and mergers. And I'll ask Jack to, to address some of the possibilities that he speaks. All right. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ezra. It, this is uh, this is, I think what, what what Ezra and I certainly like to talk about in the office. It's um, now that uh, football is in the off season. If you're an American sports fan, certainly trying to predict where uh, where the pieces are going to fall uh, for anyone that is either a free agent or anyone that's looking for um, a new home, so to speak, and certainly. Um, we really feel that Acer is is a prime company for uh, for what we call the right company. So while the company itself, um, based on its most recent year's worth of financial results, is um, exhibiting a lot of illness, it's a very sick company financially. Um, one of the benefits that it has is certainly its pull and its retail sales channels and its indirect sales channels over in, uh, and especially over in Southeast Asia um, and into um, EMEA and regions within India and even um, as far away as Russia. But it's, it's not so much that the customer base is the appeal, although certainly that's a consideration for any company um, looking to make a land grab, so to speak, but it's the, the risk-free or the risk-averse um, approach to R&D that really benefits or that could potentially benefit the right partner. Um, certainly, um, we believe that might be a company like Samsung. Um, lower cost devices or unique devices that are geared for, uh, that can be very quickly produced to cater to the demands of very different product markets from Taiwanese consumers to China consumers to Japan consumers to even some of the consumers here in the States and especially tying that into not only Samsung's Windows PC strategy, but its, its strengthening and uh, its strengthening leadership or its growing leadership in what is becoming a, a very important market um, that, that we're continuing to monitor, and that's the Chromebook marketplace. So combining the risk-friendly uh, risk R&D culture as well as its pre-existing sales channels and the brand cachet that, that Acer does have in certain regions of the world would certainly benefit a company like Samsung. On the flip side, it could also represent a opportunity for a company that is trying to fill out its device's portfolio. This is why we identify Huawei as a potential candidate for this type of acquisition also. Huawei is very strong in China uh, with its data center components. Um, it, creates or produces, uh, manufactures, I should say, most of the telecom equipment that is used for the 3G and 4G networks within China. And it also has a very rapidly growing um, smartphone and tablet business, primarily on the lower end and the mid-tiers of the marketplace. But completing that device's portfolio in concert with the major themes that we're bringing across in this presentation today would certainly help not only Acer, uh, excuse me, Huawei gain um, additional share and establish footholds in new markets, but the PC business would allow uh, Huawei to continue to expand its footholds in businesses in which it is already one of the leading vendors over in APAC. Uh, Huawei continues to grow 
its business very, very rapidly, certainly stoked by some of the success that it's had with the rapid proliferation of 4G networks in China as the carriers there begin to transition from some of the legacy technologies. Um, the company follows a very familiar footprint to some of the early days in the, in the tech business here in the States and in Europe where um, the company provides the underlying infrastructure and then uses that particular uh, data center product, be it servers or storage or any kind of back office type of uh, applications to, to then channel through sales of its smartphones, its tablets, and the other devices which could ultimately uh, become PCs or Chromebooks given Huawei's stance as a top five Android vendor. It would certainly make sense for Huawei to bridge uh, to create a bridge into the Chrome ecosystem as well as the Android ecosystem. So next slide, please, Allison. Okay. So let's let's talk a little bit about some other possible products. One product that that we for which we've seen a considerable uptake, <coughs> excuse me, is the Chromebook. We believe that the Chromebook will continue to grow, but we believe in terms of a portfolio play. It's really, um, it's really a PC. It's, it's a PC in terms of largely of its hardware. It's a PC largely in terms of its channels. It's slightly differentiated in its marketing, but we, we see this not really as a, 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 a new item in the portfolio, but rather a within form factor diversification. Similarly, we believe wearables are not really standalone categories. We believe that that uh, most likely the watch will evolve as a kind of expected wearable, that uh, expected a peripheral to a smartphone. It only makes sense to have a, a device that you always have with you communicate with it, another device you always have with you and rely on one of them to be the, the, the server yeah, as it were to the, to the uh, to the, um, the client that, that you wear on your wrist or on your eyes or wherever. And finally, we believe that, that uh, the Nest concept was intended to be a proliferation of home devices. You really don't build a business on a device people upgrade approximately every 25 years. <laughs> Excuse me. And indeed, Nest had already uh, produced its second, its second product, a, a smoke and CO2 alarm. We believe there's an enormous growth potential in smart connected products in the home and that we, we will see many uh, eggs hatching in Google's nest and that those are opportunities also for other vendors to play in that space. Specifically, we see opportunities for uh, better networking products. Frankly, home networking is uh, both an opportunity for Google in terms of, a, of an attractive product and, and a something Google would like to see better served in order to drive its primary business of keeping people online with Google all hours of the day and night. We think that Google has some intellectual property in the IP telephony space, and that some hardware that goes along with that would be something they might want to play in. And finally, we believe there's potential for, for better moves in the uh, set-top, set-side box market, you know, building on Google's already positive experience with Chromecast. So that winds up our, our presentation on the on what we call the portfolio awards. Uh, let's open the, the, the lines for questions. Great, thanks. Uh, we had a couple questions come through, guys, already. Um, we actually had a question um, <clears throat> in relation to one of the uh, topics you're talking about from uh, Samsung. And the question is, isn't Samsung exiting the notebook PC market? Well, that came up as a report uh, sometime last year with Samsung denied, but it's not unreasonable to think that if not quite exiting the market, Samsung's current stance is to put PCs on a do not resuscitate order. However, um, they also are quite enthusiastic about Chromebooks, and as we say, we believe that is a PC category, and we believe that they may reconsider their view about, about PCs. Uh, PCs were, were, in, were considered a, a problem product during the precipitous drop in PC sales. So we think they are an enduring product. They are an anchor product 
Uh, we think if you're making a portfolio play, it, it makes sense, and particularly if you are uh, in in both markets, both pizza, uh, consumer and commercial, it makes sense. Now, Samsung is much more uh, consumer than commercial, and they choose to cut it off at that point and say it will it will promote Chromebooks largely in the commercial markets where basically it, it's got the bulk of its Chromebooks now in the education market. But it is it is a product that it is an acquisition they might consider because there's a real complementarity. Acer um, is is a actually a fairly healthy company that made one mistake and then got hit by uh, the recession. Uh, it it's got uh, it's got a solid brand it's, or a collection of brands. It, it's got uh, uh, an endure, enduring channel, um, and and it doesn't overlap. It's got some some new products in the pipeline that are interesting. And it doesn't overlap very much with the Samsung in, in that it, it did its it manufacturing by contract. So that's a possibility, but you're quite right. Samsung has not shown any enthusiasm for the PC form factor over the last several years. Yeah, and Ezra, point? I just, uh, Ezra, I'd just like to add on that, that it, Samsung has continued to operate its PC business at a loss for numerous years, not just over the most recent quarters since the since the beginning of the slowdown in the PC industry. Um, if there were a product line to be uh, that Samsung would exit from, I I, th I think it's more likely based on the uh, based on the increased uh, cost to manufacture would be the desktop PC business. Um, with Samsung smart with Samsung smartphone business beginning to slow, and it becoming more aware of its gross and operating margins. Um, those more expensive all-in-one desktops um, that, while very lucrative when they're sold, um, continue to experience a slowdown even um, to a much more dramatic extent than the notebook PC business, um, really kind of put the, the crosshairs, if there are any, in Samsung's product line on, on that particular one. Um, one interesting note that did come across the wire over the last couple of days is that there are rumors of Sony um, exiting the PC business and uh, um, entering into a partnership with uh, a company you may have heard of called Lenovo. Um, so that's uh, something that um, I'm sure the bloggers and the uh, M&A experts out in the field are certainly um, eyeing with some degree of care and uh, very closely. Uh, but in regards to Samsung in, in particular, I think it might be more prudent to say that they're ultimately down the road, their PC play, if you will, may actually wind up being Chromebooks, um, given the traction that that particular form factor and that particular product is having in education markets as well as um, in, in parts of the public sector. Okay. Uh, the next question we had come through. Uh, as a tweener device, is the tablet a long-term device, or does it go the way of the PDA? Um, the person was making a joke, personal digital assistant, not public display of affection, in case there was any question about that. Okay. Um, I think there's, there's real enduring value in tablets because, <laughs> excuse me, they're a substitute technology for, for the printed word. So at the very least, um, users will will want a tablet uh, as as a a large enough screen on which to view the printed word. My printed word, I mean not only books but magazines and other things without the being tied down to a, a PC, which is a large screen on which you can show pages and pictures and things like that. And at the low end of the market, which is uh, uh, growing rapidly in terms of capabilities, at the very least, people will have a tablet, if not more than one tablet. It's actually a far less expensive way of distributing uh, the word that in the past was printed on paper and certainly far more uh, uh, ecologically sound. So, the, the, so I see the, the, the tablet as being a permanent part of the, the user collections among uh, the market that is not terribly tightly constrained by, by resources, uh, whether that's an inexpensive tablet for reading in addition to a, a PC and a, and a smartphone or a uh, a tablet that is also a PC in the, in the form of a Windows 8 tablet, 
in which case you might well end up supplementing that with a smaller one. In any case, I think the tablet has real legs. Uh, next question, please. Sure. Uh, TBR said in a recent webinar that Chromebook growth might lift total PC market growth to lower double digits. Where will all this Chromebook growth come from, and will it cannibalize PC and products like tablets? Um, let me answer the second question first. Yes, it will. It's, uh, there are, whether it will cannibalize the only PC, the main PC in the house, well, it will in some cases, but it will not in many cases. So what we project going forward in 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 uh, the market to be to be ex explored by by Chromebook is is uh, increase. Uh, Chromebook has become very important in the education market. We got a lot of reports from last year that said it was that a lot of Chromebooks were bought by schools. Uh, it's also going to the into the education market in some sense, in that it's being bought by by parents for children and by young adults for schoolwork. Uh, but uh, it, 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 that brings it into the consumer market, and Google and its OEM partners have worked very hard this year to make it play in the consumer market to avoid some of the pitfalls of, of the early netbooks to make sure that customers understand the, the strengths and limitations of Chromebooks and, uh, and, and are able to transition into a Chromebook. And we think it has a real has real legs in the consumer market. Finally, down the line, and I believe this is more in the three to five year frame, and it may not happen depending on what, what Microsoft does with its email services, uh, it has real potential in, in uh, other institutions, starting with other public institutions, where it's already making headway and, uh, uh, and going into business. We're basically large businesses with many PC users look among, among their user base and say, most of my users don't need a full-fledged, very powerful PC with which one can do uh, heavy-duty spreadsheeting and, and write long documents and so on and so forth. They basically need email, web browsing, and new content machine. The, the Chromebook is a winner immediately on, on the price of purchase, but that's not the real benefit. The Chromebook, we believe, has a much lower CCO in the institution and uh, has fewer security problems. So we think there's a real potential uh, uh, in, for, for Chromebook in, in, in large businesses. The critical issue here is that um, Outlook, uh, Microsoft email, email uh, solution, is not up to date. It, 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 it fails in many comparisons with Gmail. There are, are restrictions to Gmail. There are inhibitions to Gmail some of which might be, might be removed. Basically, many companies will not allow a multi-tenant hosting solution to their email problem. They won't trust Google with their email. But if Google were to strike deals with other hosting uh, entities, um, that would remove some of the inhibition to, to using Chromebook uh, in, in business. Next question, please. Uh, why would Chromebook sales not just cannibalize PC sales rather than being so incremental as to lift the category? Well, that's well, I, it's not a, it's not 100% cannibalization because it's like the tablet, a, a very useful uh, companion product for people who uh, who have the resources to to have a companion product. It can it can be in another location. It it can be used for other functions and for many users. Having one core PC is still uh, an important, you know, full-fledged PC is, is still important to them. Uh, but, yeah, it does have, certainly does have a high category. Okay. Uh, the next question. How do you see the tablet market interacting with the phablet and smartphone uh, uh, wood moving forward? Uh, isn't a phablet with keyboard a logical outcome of your converged device narrative? I mean, the, the question is, is, is how far do you stretch the form factor? Is making the screen large enough to make it usable with a keyboard or make it screen large enough to be comfortable for reading documents and magazines um, make it an unpalatable phone for many users? And I think the answer is yes. I think the tablet has a real market, but I don't think it's all the smartphone users in the world. Uh, world, an awful lot of us, you know, define the 
the limits to the size of the smartphone we carry by the, the pockets in our small, in the smallest pockets in anything we wear. Uh, also, I think even at the high end, that screen is awfully small for keyboard devices. So yes, many users will try to have one product that does it all uh, because it's less mainly. Uh, but I think that, that you, it, it's not merely a matter of price. Things that are small enough to put in the pocket aren't large enough to do other things. And they really need some specialized devices. And I, so I, I think the tablet plays a role, but it doesn't consume the, the other, other form factors. Right, yeah. And Ezra, I'd like to add from our from our study, it showed that as soon as the screen size got to around this uh eight inches or below, um, the act the act the the activities were slanted almost what I call one way. It was almost all streaming media. It was consuming um information off the internet or browsing a website or looking up sports scores. I mean, so a whole roster of more social casual activities um, it it speaks to the impact that the screen size has on ultimately what a consumer and what we want to do with it too. I know um, my my fat fingers certainly wouldn't allow me to be able to be um, as productive on a tablet as I would on something like a multi-mode PC that I could um, flip open and then use the actual keyboard to bang out something. I just uh, I just don't have the dexterity, you know, that you know my son does on the on the software <laughs> keyboard, but um, so certainly, um, those those that that particular aspect, the the screen size is a tremendous influencer. Based on what we saw in our study, is a tremendous influencer on what ultimately consumers and users of these types of devices want to do and and seek to use their devices for in the future. Okay, um, we actually had a uh, request to have you guys give some commentary around wearable technology. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll. Specifically, it said, what's the take um, on wearable technology? <laughs> what's our take on wearable technology? We believe that wearable technology uh, is, is, a, is a, a real market um, and, and will grow, but we believe it is not a market changer the way that smartphones and tablets work, and that it will grow up around the accessory as an accessory to the smartphone. The, the obvious real growth area for wearable technology is health, where a device you have monitors major uh, signs about your, your current health and, and record, records them in your phone device. Um, and, and, uh, and secondly, I think personal safety, where, where it's aware of where you are and, and you can ask it for help and, and very, very quickly. The, um, the, the smartphones are... Both uh, Apple and, and Motorola have, have uh, made them awake when they are asleep to a certain extent. They've included the capability of running some processes at very low battery drain. Apple built in uh, its own separate processor, the M7, for doing that, and we think that fits with wearable. Uh, if you're asking me about Google Glass, um, I still think it makes you look like you've been assimilated by the Borg. Um, I don't think a, a, a killer app has been found for that form factor. I think the price of Google Glass is not simply the purchase price or the price of looking weird in public, but it's also the price of having a distraction in the corner of your eye. I don't see that as a, a winner as a, you know, wear all the time or wear for long periods of time device. I can easily see it as something you would wear in certain situations and it, it might be lent to you or rented to you uh, uh, in, in certain circumstances. Right, yeah, and I'd like to add, Ezra, that when when we take a look at a product like Glass, I think ultimately um, it's, I think it's fair to make a comparison to a device like the Segway, where the technology and the R&D that goes into building a product that ultimately failed to resonate with the consumer in the Segway's case and is um, Certainly has some uh, some opposition, if you will, in the marketplace when 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 we consider glass. But the R and D, the engineering, um, the miniaturization technology that's going into glass, I think ultimately might be more beneficial down the road for future 
types of wearable electronics that aren't uh, quite so look like they uh, jumped out of the uh, j jumped off the screen from from the latest Star Trek movie. So, yep. Um, okay, so we have a couple more questions in queue, and we are running out of time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this last one. Um, we managed to get through an entire briefing without discussing Microsoft. How do you see Windows <laughs> 9? <laughs> That's why I asked you guys. I thought you'd get a kick out of that. Uh, how do you see Windows 9, et cetera, affecting Windows PC tablet sales? Will Microsoft save itself or sputter and die? Are you kidding me? <laughs> sputter and die? Are you kidding me? This, this is a gigantic company with a, with a virtual monopoly on, 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 the, on the serious computing and the business computing space. Uh, it's actually growing and, and immensely profitable. Uh, As will quick, it, uh, there was a clarification that mainly interested in the future of Windows on tablets convertibles with touch, so that might change. Okay, I, 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 I think that the, the, the Windows tablet, the, even the Windows 8 tablet with its, with its drawback, is a, is a very strong play as a device to get, with which to get serious work done. It's not as, as amenable to playful use as, as the other tablets, but uh, I think it, 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 it certainly has a, it will be, there'll be a large uptake in, in businesses and, and, a, and a large uptake among people who basically uh, want a, a tablet that does some, some core tablet things but don't want to, uh, you know, be shopping for apps and things like that. The, the story will get better. Frankly, I think Windows 8 was a very impressive piece of engineering and a not too terrible piece of, of user interface design, um, but it will take time to get used to and, 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 uh, and things will improve. I, I, think, I think Microsoft's uh, presence in the, what you might call the thin flat PC space is enduring. You know, when you have a, what is basically a thin flat PC, which is to say a Windows tablet, whether when you get a small one to, to read in bed, it's also Windows. Sort of depends on the price. It's a perfectly good reader, as good as any other tablet except Paperwhite. Uh, so if you like that, you'll get it. And if you don't feel like running all the games or buying all the latest apps, and if it doesn't cost significantly more, why not? Any other questions? Uh, we, well, there are, but we actually are at the end of the hour, and so I know people are either going to get off to lunch or go out and snow the, uh, plow their snow. So I think with that, we're going to – the questions that we have left, we'll follow up with those folks individually. Um, so it's probably time to wrap up. So with that, a uh, couple things that I wanted to share with folks that are on the line. Um, <clears throat> we are sending out the slides, as we said, by tomorrow. I wanted to draw your attention to the coverage that uh, Jack and Ezra and their team are working on. Um, so you can get a look at all the reports they're working on. If you want to get access to any of that information or speak to them about anything that's covered in these, please do reach out directly. <clears throat> As I mentioned, I'm going to share all the social media links with you, so I encourage you to follow Ezra, Jack, and TBR on Twitter to see what they're talking about and where they're being covered in the media. Um, so we do encourage you uh, to join us on that conversation. Additionally, you can follow us on SlideShare and YouTube and check out other presentations that Jack and Ezra have uh, participated on and look at some of the other commentaries uh, and uh, decks that are on SlideShare to learn more about what TBR is saying about the market. So with that, um, I'd like to thank everyone for your time today. On your way out of the webinar, we have a short survey. Uh, we'd like to get your feedback on how valuable the presentation was, how good the presenters were, and any other open-ended comments or questions you may have for the analysts. If you'd like to see us cover more topics in depth, if you'd like to see our research agenda take a specific turn, um, we do look at these comments and, and use it for our topics meeting quarter to quarter, so your feedback is important to us. I'm going to leave the chat function open for another minute or so in case there's any last-minute requests for information or conversations uh, or questions you'd like to pause for the analysts. Um, and if we don't hear from you now, we look forward to speaking to you guys all again next quarter with the next round of devices webinars. So thanks, everyone. Uh, stay warm and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.